Um, let's talk about those equation packets. So first of all, uh, lab number six, we're going to do in class on Tuesday. As I mentioned previously, we're going to be swi switching the class and the uh, lab time so that you have more time uh, to take the exam. Um, what I'm going to be aiming for is I'm going to be aiming for a test that you'll be able to complete in 90 minutes. So, um, the equation packet that I've just given you, that's the FE uh, supplied reference manual. Um, approximately a year from now, you'll start thinking about taking the fundamentals of engineering exam. Um, actually, this coming offering of the exam in October is the last time it's going to be on pencil and paper. When you take the FE exam, it'll be a computer-based test that you sign up uh, at a testing center and you go take it um, whenever you like. Uh, the way it's going to work is that the FE will be offered for two months, so it'll be available for taking January and February. Then the month of March, the FE will be closed, and then it'll be available April and May, closed in June. So it'll be the sequence of two months on, one month off, and then any time it's during the in period is when you can sign up with uh, Pearson, I think, is the lab or the exam administrator and go take it. Um, the reference manual that's available when you're taking the test is actually a PDF, a searchable PDF. And so if you get a test that's a, a question about a manometer, you'd be able to search the PDF for manometer and it would, boom, hopefully take you right to the equation that you need. So that'll make it a little bit easier, but there's just a huge correlation between familiarity with the reference manual and success on the exam. And that's why what I'm going to do this semester and also next semester in hydraulics is have you use the exam reference manual for the FE uh, for your exams in this course. Is I, I want you to be familiar with that reference so that you do well on the FE exam when that time comes. And we, I've done that with students in the past and they said that it works out great. You, you sort of become acquainted not only with the location of the equation that you need, but also sometimes the equations are formatted a little bit differently. If they use a different variable for something than you're accustomed to from one text or another, that can really throw you off. If you're used to seeing, uh, you know, unit weight with a gamma, but then in the reference manual they use some other Greek symbol for unit weight, that's something that if you're in the middle of the FE exam and they throw that curveball at you, it could really sort of uh, throw you off and waste a bunch of time. So trying to get all that done before test day by suggesting that you begin to use the uh, FE manual as soon as possible. So this is a free PDF download. I'll email you all the link so in case you want to look at it for other courses. I think that, are, are you taking soil mechanics this semester? Materials. Next semester? So materials, you know, there's a materials section, there's a soil mechanics section, all of the uh, all of the courses that you'll take have essentially a section in the FE manual that you could start acquainting yourself with. So yes, bring this on exam day because this is the packet that I'll allow you to use during the test on Tuesday. Um, does the test cover what today? Or? Yes. Yeah, the exam, on, uh, the exam in lab on Tuesday covers today's class. Um, Okay, so the homework assignment is due on Tuesday. And just to take the crowding away from Tuesday, I moved the lab. Instead of having the lab submission on Tuesday as well, which would be our normal sequence of, you know, you do an experiment and you have a, a week to do the report for it, I decided to move lab number five, the due date for that, to Thursday. And so, um, you know, you'll still have the exam on Tuesday and the homework assignment due on Tuesday, but that lab report you can submit on Thursday, the 3rd of October. Yes? On the lab report, are there graphs that you need to make in terms of graphs that you need to make? Yeah. Um, for buoyancy in this case, I don't really think there are any graphs that you need to make. Um, that probably wouldn't apply, but uh, certainly you can express it as a table. Yeah. Homework 3C, is that exact question? Yes, it, that's, that stuff is uh, fair game for the exam. And so if you want to check your answers on any of those problems before you submit it, I'm more than happy to let you know if you've done it right. Stop by my office during office hours, uh, or you know, if my office door is open, I don't mind you stopping by outside of office hours. And you can check your answers with me. I'd be happy to, to let you know. Mm -hmm. Now, are you in your office at all during Friday and Mondays? Your office hours, I'm in class. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm in my office for much of uh, Friday and Monday. We have a department meeting on Friday afternoon, but besides that, I'm around a lot of the time. And my, if my doors open a crack, feel free to, I usually keep it sort of closed just to keep the noise down, but uh, if I'm in there, I'd be happy to go over answers with you or answer your question. You should use the actual unit weight for the temperature that it was. So it was 20 degrees Celsius, then you should use the actual unit weight for 20 degrees. We're continuing our discussion of buoyancy today. And uh, we're also going to talk about stability of floating bodies, which will be the lab that we do next Tuesday. So um, before we jump into that, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, head start on the homework assignment that's due on Tuesday by discussing some of these key ideas. And so on problem 359, it asks you to find the force of the block on the plate. You can see that if this block wasn't here, the gate would rotate open. And why would it rotate open if the pivot is at the center of area? Why is it that, that, that the hydrostatic forces would cause the gate to open? What's that? It's below the pivot. It's not right on the centroid. Okay. So the, the hydrostatic force, remember, is going to be a little bit lower than the centroid. The Y bar is always greater than YCP. And so this block has to uh, provide a force this way to resist the moment. So the, the moment distance won't be very big because it'll be just very slightly below the center of area with as deeply submerged as that is the center of area and the center of pressure get pretty close together. But still, there, it'll be a little bit lower than the pivot point, and then the, the hydrostatic pressure will be uh, pressing on it. So what you'll need to do essentially is it's a moment analysis to find out how big the force has to be to counteract the hydrostatic force that's acting at the center of, uh, the center of pressure. So, I mean, this is just a standard, it being an inclined Vertically in oriented plate, it's pretty easy to do the calculations. Y bar and delta H will be the same. Levi? So you say that the pivot and velocity That's right. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't open as long as the water was 10 meters. But remember, if you were filling it up gradually, then the, uh, when you first started filling it, the YCP would be lower than the Y bar. You know, if the water was just to here, then the Y, then the uh, centroid would be at the center and the YCP would be two-thirds of the way down. But yeah, if, if the pivot was at the YCP, then it wouldn't, the gate wouldn't open. We wouldn't need the block. Other questions? All right, here's one. Uh, it asks you to find the magnitude, location, and direction of the forces on the gate. So magnitude, location, by location they mean, um, you know, how far deep is the, uh, the equivalent hydrostatic force that's acting on the vertical projection. You need to find um, the vertical forces and the horizontal forces. Now, the vertical forces is by the water weight. And this is one of those instances where there isn't any water weight above, the, above this gate. You know, here is the, the surface that we're trying to find the forces on. The hydrostatic forces, the water's pushing on the gate here. The pressure is lower at the bottom of the gate than it is at the top. Um, but if you find the weight of the water that would be above the gate, that will allow you to calculate the vertical force. And of course, the location of the vertical force, you're going to have to find a weighted average. And we've done that in the, the two separate classes. What we've done is we've broken it up into a piece. And if you look at the element here, it's going to be a quarter circle. And then above that will be a rectangle. And you'll need to find the average location for the force of each of them and then combine them together to find the uh, the, the location of the vertical forces. And then the horizontal forces, remember, 
a vertical projection of the curve. And so if it's a curved gate that has a, uh, a length of one meter from top to bottom, and it's one meter into the page, then that's going to be a one by one rectangular vertical projection. So you're going to be finding the hydrostatic forces on a rectangular one by one gate that's vertically oriented in order to find the horizontal F sub H force. The resultant force is the square root of the sum of the squares. So the, the, really the key here is that with the vertical forces, just reminding you that the weight of the water that would be above the gate is how you can find the vertical forces on that plate. Okay, here's another hydrostatic forces on a curved gate. And um, this is a, uh, like a, uh, a screw or something that's uh, plugging up a hole. And um, it's a hemisphere. And they give you enough information. They, they tell you the radius of the hemisphere. And so uh, what you'll need to do is find the vertical and the horizontal forces that are acting on the plug due to hydrostatic pressure. Now, um, the horizontal forces are easy because you just think, what does the projection look like of a hemisphere? The projection is just going to be a circle. And so this will be a little bit different because now you're going to have to use the area moment of inertia formula for a circle. And that's in the back of your book. Previously, for the I, remember, whenever we had rectangles, we just used AB cubed divided by 12. Well, for a circle, that's not the formula anymore. We worked an example where we had an ellipse, for example. You'll need to go into the back of the book and find the area moment of inertia formula for a circle when you're finding the horizontal forces and use that and also the location. Um, Actually, it looks like, I think in this problem, they may not even ask you the location of the forces. I think it may just be the magnitude. How do you think you can find the vertical forces on this problem? Morgan, do you have any ideas about the vertical forces? Remembering that when we worked this problem, the vertical forces had to do with the weight of the water that would have been there. So what about this? How do you find the vertical forces that are acting on this plug. Okay? It could be the weight of the water above the plug, or, but the, the shape of that would be very unusual. If you think about it, because this is, um, this is a hemisphere, and so think about the shape of the water that is above that. This is just a cross section that we're looking at right here. It sort of goes this way, and so it would be very difficult to, to calculate that shape. Um, you could, you could subtract, you know, you could use the subtraction method and just say what would a, um, what would a rectangle look like that's above this and then subtract out the hemisphere part and that would work perfectly. Or you can just find the buoyant forces. And the buoyant forces I think is the, is the easier way here. The vertical forces uh, are equal to, um, how much water does this plug displace? And that's why with this O-ring, that they've given you that critical dimension there of the O-ring because uh, you're going to need to find out how much volume of water does that plug actually displace. And the dimension of the O-ring comes into play for that. All right. The last little hint that I wanted to give you is on this problem where you've got a floating platform that's resting on pontoons under the water. Uh, this is just a cross section. If you looked at it uh, from above, it would look like this. There are these pontoons that are holding up some sort of a skeletal platform. They go down into the water, these floating barrels of a sort. And you can see that they're saying from the dimensions that the diameter of the barrel is one meter, and we don't know what L is, but there is a one meter freeboard between the water surface and the uh, beginning of the platform. So in other words, one meter of barrel is above the water surface. Okay? Uh, the weight of the structure is the weight of the platform and the weight of the pontoons. And it says in the problem statement that those pontoons weigh one kilonewton per meter of length. 
So how heavy this whole system is depends on how long L is. But there's a buoyant force as well. So the sum of the forces equal to zero tells us that we've got buoyant forces pushing the platform up and the weight of the structure is acting down. And so you're going to need to write an equation that expresses the buoyant force in terms of L and also the weight in terms of L. And so you'll be able to solve for the unknown L by combining the unknown weight and the unknown buoyant force together. So the sum of the forces will be equal to zero. It'll be in equilibrium when, uh, when L is just long enough to hold up the weight of the structure. So Michelle, how do you know what the, uh, the buoyant force is going to be in this case? Exactly. So it's the, the volume displaced under the water line. So you'll need to calculate the cross-sectional area of these barrels. So you, you do that with the diameter. And then the submerged volume would be L minus 1. And then multiply that by 4 because there's 4 of the barrels. So remember, F sub B is unit weight times volume displaced. And in this case, volume displaced is going to be 4, because there's 4 barrels, times the whatever volume underneath the water line is. And the volume under the water line is going to be L minus 1 times the cross-sectional area of the barrels. Any questions about that? Okay. Has anybody been following the America's Cup or America's Cup? It's a sailing race. It's pretty crazy. Let, let me, I, I wanted to show some pictures of the crazy sailboats that they're using, but they're so unusual that they never actually show the entire boat. Check out some of these crazy boats, what they look like. It's like a hydrofoil. Uh, it's, um, when they get going really fast, they've got these submerged um, like a wing. And it sails where the boat itself is up out of the water. And so there's hardly any friction at all. There's just this little submerged wing, uh, like a hydrofoil wing that's underneath the water. And um, it looks like it'd be pretty crazy to be sailing on one of those things. It's been the American team versus the New Zealand team. Um, they, they've had, uh, I think, 12 races till now, and it's tied 6-6. Six to six. Um, You can see here it's up out of the water as it goes. I think that these can get going about like 40 or 50 miles an hour. They're very, very fast. And uh, sometimes they tip over. <laughs> they, they really are pushing the edge, and uh, they actually ruined the first one. This is the, uh, the American team. Uh, earlier in the summer when they were testing it. But I think they must have got their techniques down. And um, here's a good one. It shows they're basically just wings and wings underneath the water surface as well. So here's a far more traditional, um, a far more traditional sailing vessel. And let me ask you, why doesn't it tip over? When the wind is blowing on the sail like that, what's preventing it from tipping over right now? Uh, the till is how it steers. But there's something under the water. I've sailed before and just can't remember what it's called. It's depending on the side of the boat. Uh -huh. All right. So there's something heavy under the water. A counterbalance, all right. And also, you can see that they're sitting on the edge there. So having all the, the weight on the edge probably helps to tip it the correct way. Um, it is possible to tip it over. And so uh, you know how closely they're sailing into the wind and the angle of the sail relative to the wind will also affect how, how much the boat tips over. What we're going to be talking about today is the calculations that allows you to, to determine whether or not a floating body is going to be stable. It'll help you to know whether um, something is, uh, is at risk of tipping over, like a barge, for example. 
So consider uh, these two scenarios. And they're, they're somewhat related. If you look at the shape of them, a cylindrical shape, they're both floating. They both have people standing on top. So you can tell that the kid is sort of dancing a little bit. He's trying, you know, he's concentrating. He's got that look of focus in his eyes. Why is he struggling to stay on top of his cylinder, whereas uh, these sailors don't seem to be having any trouble staying on top of their cylinder? Is it just strictly about size? Would that, if, if they all walked over to the edge, do you think they could rotate the entire submarine in the same way that the kid can rotate the, uh, the log? Mm, no. It's, it's got these on the, uh, it's got this, but that's all it's got. And in the case of the submarine, what's causing it to be stable is the fact that it has a weight at the bottom. It has both a center of buoyancy and a center of gravity, but the center of buoyancy is related to the outside shape. So the center of buoyancy doesn't know that there's this extra weight at the bottom. So C, the variable C, means center of buoyancy. Now G is talking about the center of weight or the center of gravity. And so you can see that it's lower than the centroid of a circle. And the reason why is that all this extra weight at the bottom brought the center of gravity uh, lower than the center. And so in this case, because the center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy, then that makes it stable. Uh, think about if you roll it over, what would happen? So if you try tipping it sideways, then you have what's called a riding couple. It's going to right the uh, the object so that this heavy part's going to swing back down to the bottom and reach stability again. Think about a circle uh, like that. If, if you have a little piece of paper and, uh, and you twist it the way that's indicated from these two arrows, then it's going to rotate the entire object. And so this writing couple means that it will write itself. Uh, in the case where the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy are in the same place, where it doesn't have the extra weight in figure B, then that's neutrally stable. And it means that you can rotate it and it'll stay there and it doesn't have any reason to, uh, to move one way or another. And so in the case of this cylinder, this is neutrally stable. There isn't some heavy weight inside of it that is causing uh, it to prefer to be oriented one way versus another in the water. Whereas in the case of the submarine, they have ballast down at the bottom, a heavy, uh, heavy weight that keeps it so that it's tending to have its right side up. Even though C is currently unstable, it will eventually go back to equilibrium and uh, look more like A. So think about a boat. Uh, it doesn't have to have the center of gravity below the center of buoyancy in order to be stable. Now, in this case, it's definitely stable. And the reason why it's definitely stable is because the center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy. But you can have stability. It can still be all right, even if the center of gravity is above the center of buoyancy. So consider like a tall ship. Uh, in the cases of a ship, the center of buoyancy is down here, and it has to do with how much of the volume is underneath the water line. You know, where is the aerial average? If you have a cross section like this, what is the average location for, uh, for the buoyant forces? And so here's the center of buoyancy. The center of gravity is above that. Why is the center of gravity above the center of buoyancy? That's right, you've got all this weight above the water line. So this part of the boat above the waterline is doing nothing for buoyancy. Um, since it's above the waterline, it's not displacing any water, so it's not causing directly any buoyant forces. But it still has mass, and so it's accounting for uh, some of the uh, location of the center of gravity. So if you average where is the mass of this ship, then that's G. Now, what happens if this boat starts to tip over is the question. So if the ship tips sideways, then what's going to happen is that the center of 
mass doesn't change. The center of mass or the center of gravity, it remains constant as the boat rocks side to side, assuming that the cargo doesn't shift. And that's a different thing. If the cargo uh, does shift, then the center of gravity could shift. And that's a really bad thing on board a boat. But let's say that it tips over. What happens is that now, instead of the water line being this flat level part, think about this part of the boat is further underwater, and that part of the boat is higher up. And so the, the buoyant forces are going to be greater on the right-hand side of the boat than they are on the left-hand side of the boat. And that shifts the center of buoyancy, which used to be right here in the middle. Now the center of buoyancy shifted to the right because the right side of the boat is deeper. And so what it does is then it's got that same riding couple that we saw on the previous slide, where think about if you had a tracing of this boat, and you put your finger here for the center of gravity and your other finger here for the center of buoyancy, and you pull down and push up, you're basically going to tip it back to its neutral, stable position. And so when a boat tips over, it naturally rights itself. And that's how they design ship hulls. Is they, the reason why it has the shape has partly to do with being aerodynamic as the boat moves through the water. They want it to be offering as little resistance as possible. But another part of uh, the considerations that they're balancing in naval architecture is trying to ensure that it's stable, that the center of buoyancy will shift when it tips over. I didn't see that movie, but um, I think that probably they could still have all the passengers on one side, and cruise ships are big enough that it, it wouldn't have an effect. Yeah. <clears throat> but I, I will say I didn't see that movie. So um, Now here's another term, M. We haven't had M as a variable yet, and M stands for metacenter. And what M is, is if C shifts, it points towards M. It's sort of like a central location where the center of buoyancy is constantly pushing towards. And so if you tipped this over even more, then C would shift further to the right, but it would be pointing towards M. It's all, M is the metacenter. It's the location that all of the, uh, all of the buoyant forces point towards. And, um, so we've already talked about what a riding couple is and that a ship can be stable even if the center of uh, mass or the center of gravity is above the center of buoyancy. So uh, in order to calculate whether a barge is stable or not stable, we have to calculate the area moment of inertia. And the, uh, the area moment of inertia that we're talking about is the the shape of the ship that it makes with the water line. And so uh, here's a barge that's carrying big chunks of rocks. It's being pushed around by some uh, tugboats. And uh, in this case, we have the width of it, B, is the smaller of the two dimensions. And so that's why we're cubing B instead of A. You know, the area moment of inertia for a rectangle is A, B cubed divided by 12. And so how do you know which one is A and which one is B? The shortest dimension is B, the dimension that you're going to cube in this case. And so for a barge, a barge is a lot, very long and relatively not, not as wide as it is long. And so you cube the shorter of those two dimensions. Now here's a formula for something called metacentric height, GM. Now GM is a, a distance, it is a, it's a way of thinking about the, uh, how far you are away from instability. Uh, you really want GM to be positive because a positive GM means that the, uh, that the object is going to be stable and when it tips it will naturally right itself. So I is the area moment of inertia that we just talked about. It's the, uh, the length component, the width component, 
and uh, you can calculate the area moment of inertia with the water line. V is the submerged volume underneath the water line. And then CG is the distance, how far away the center of gravity is from the center of buoyancy. And that's something that you can take a measurement of by knowing the mass of the ship. Um, and if GM is positive, that means the body is stable. And negative, it means it's unstable. So what I've got is an in-class exercise. I'd like you to get together in groups of two or three. You can't complete this one individually. You have to work with at least one other partner. And I'd like you to do some buoyancy calculations and then stability calculations. And then after you've had some time to work on it, we'll go through the result together. I'll take one copy from the person who's got the nicest handwriting. But be sure and put all three names on it. Okay, who's working with who? Are you in your groups already? Okay. Good. Here, are you working with Andrew? All right, so in the, uh, the bonus part, we're assuming, you know, it's getting narrower, and so that's reducing the volume that's displaced. And as it gets narrower, that's also changing the area moment of inertia. We were setting uh, CG equal to I divided by V. In reality, if you make it narrower, then the way that this barge is going to respond to that is it's going to sit deeper in the water in order to do that. And so CG would have changed as well would have made things a little bit more complicated if we had adjusted CG, but because it's just very little, it's not a lot narrower for this to be unstable. It's six meters wide, and all we have to do is take it down to 5.9 meters wide, approximately, and it's unstable all of a sudden. And so, um, you know, that sort of explains a lot about uh, the stability of floating bodies, and when we have the lab next Tuesday, what we're going to be taking is those same little boats that you used in the buoyancy lab, and uh, we're going to be tipping them over. And you may have noticed that on that um, apparatus that we were using in lab, it has a weight that you can move side to side, and also a weight that you can move up and down. And by moving the weight that goes up and down higher up on the mast, what you're doing is you're taking the center of gravity, uh, and you're moving it up. And so when the weight, let me just draw a quick representation of that device. So it looks like this, and there's something that goes through here that you've got a heavy weight here that's on there. And then there's also a mass that goes up from the bottom. And then there's a weight that can move up and down this way. So if this is at the top, if this adjustable weight, the vertical one, is all the way at the top, and then you begin to move the side-to-side -side weight back and forth. So let's say it's uh, the vertical weight is at top. It can either be at the top or at the bottom. Okay, so what happens to the response, the tipping response, 
I'm not talking about going to a restaurant or anything about that. How much does it tip over if the weight's all the way at the top and you begin to move it side to side versus if this vertical weight is at the bottom and you start to move the horizontal weight to the side? How do things change? It should be bottom to bottom. I mean, it was so t I mean if it's up, the weight's at the very top, okay. it should be too top head if you're moving weight over something. It's okay, so if it's all the way at the top, you may need to only move the horizontal weight two or three centimeters before it is really tipping over. And there's a little string on here, in fact, so that when it's tipped sideways, here's the water line, when it is tipped like this, and here's the mast, there's a string that will be hanging down, and it's got a weight on the end of the string, and you're able to measure the tipping angle. There's a little bit of a, of a gauge around here, and it'll say like, 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, and so on. So you're going to be moving this horizontal weight to the side, and then you're going to be measuring how much does that boat tip over in response to shifting the uh, center of mass side to side, up and down. So you're going to be applying these same stability of floating bodies calculations in the lab that we have on Tuesday. So we're going to actually be a, under a little bit of a time crunch on Tuesday because it'll be everyone in the lab all at once. We're not going to be splitting into group A and group B. So it'll be all of us, and we've only got two of those devices. And so you know, we'll have the 50-minute time period to, uh, to take the data. And uh, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about that now. Uh, let's just jump up to these announcements before you go for the day. Remember that your homework assignment that's due on uh, the homework assignment that's due on Tuesday, if, since it's due the same day as the exam, if you want to get some feedback on whether you've done those problems correctly, just feel free to stop by my office, and I'd be happy to go over that with you. Uh, look through the equation packet before the exam. You know, some of these equations, it, it looks a lot better than it used to in the eighth edition. This is the ninth edition that they just barely issued. And uh, in fact, they made some changes to uh, center of pressure and the hydrostatic equation formulas. It used to just be a mess. Now it looks great by comparison. But acquaint yourself with the format that the formulas are in just so that you're prepared for the exam on Tuesday. And uh, I will see you then. Have a great weekend.